thank you for turning into Minding Your Brain. Today we are going to talk about your road to recovery from a brain injury and tools that will help you to be a new you in the new year. My name is Candace Gant and I am the Executive Director and Founder of the Mind Your Brain Foundation. My guests today are Claire Zatars and Dr. Jillian Murray. Claire has been working in case management and services delivery per for persons with neurological impairments for nearly 10 years. She is currently a social service liaison for Einstein's Behavioral Neurological Program, working with patients and caregivers to give appropriate resources in their communities. Claire is pursuing her Master's of Social Work at Westchester University. Dr. Murray has worked in the field of brain injury rehabilitation since 2005. She has been with Moss Rehab for the past eight years, supporting individuals with brain injuries to return to life roles. Additionally, Dr. Murray founded and oversees a social work clinic at Moss Rehab and lectures at Rutgers University in the School of Social Work. Welcome, Claire and Jillian. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, it's very exciting to be here, Candace. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start off, if I could, uh, talking a little bit about the brain injury survivors, what kind of symptoms, what kind of deficits do they do they work with? I know that we had a program last month that talked about that, but just help us remember some of those deficits. Sure. So I think that a lot of that depends on the type of injury that someone has as well as the severity. But I think that a lot of times what we frequently see is a loss of life roles. So whether that means that someone is no longer working, they're unable to participate around the house as much as they usually do, uh, and do things that we call activities of daily living or ADLs. So ADLs are anything from getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth, getting dressed, through driving and doing all of the things that make up our day. So it really, a brain injury can impact your planning and organization in ways that make doing those everyday things more difficult. It's so serious that they can't get back to a normal activity. Yes, it's, just... it's very challenging. And along with it, Jillian and I had looked into research recently about the anxiety and depression after traumatic brain injury, and the rates are based on the literature, at least 40% of people after a traumatic brain injury experience anxiety, depression, or both. Oh my goodness. So what kind of help is out there for this, for this population? How do they get help? That's a great question. So there are funding sources. Luckily, in the state of Pennsylvania, there are a couple of different funding sources uh, that I believe that Jillian is planning on talking about in a little bit. But um, we do have funding sources, but something that we see that complicates this is lack of access to those funding sources. People don't know that they're there or their physicians or providers don't know to refer them to these sources. I remember after my brain injury that my insurance has been exhausted and I fell off a cliff. There wasn't anything else. There wasn't any valuable resources for me to get more help and I knew I needed it. So there's funding available. Tell us a little bit more about that and the availability of that. So I think you bring up a really good point that once your insurance benefits were exhausted, then what? And I think that's something that a lot of people experience after brain injury. So there's really uh, three available funding sources in the state of Pennsylvania. And the state of Pennsylvania is actually one of the better states for funding. So we're, we're blessed to have what we have, mm -hmm. um, but there's still some challenges accessing those funding sources and there's some pretty stringent el eligibility requirements. So for the Head Injury Program of Pennsylvania, it's a one-time program. So it's a year of intensive support followed by six months of transitional case management. And you have to be a U.S. citizen, which can be a barrier for a lot of people. Yes. You have to have proof of Pennsylvania residency at time of injury. That can be really hard to prove. And that's something that people struggle with because that means you have to have documentation at the time of your injury. Some people don't have that. Indeed. And then there's income eligibility requirements. So it's about $36,000 a year that you can make in order to qualify for the program. So if you're over that income, you don't qualify. And then there's not really anything else for you unless your goal is to return to work. Then there's the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation helps persons with disability try to return to work and support them in returning to work. So it's not just for folks with brain injury, but that's what we're talking about today. Um, so they do provide support, but it is limited. Um, the 
OVR change to the supported employment model, and there are much more uh, stringent limitations as to how much support you can receive um, without getting too into it. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there, there are time limits on what services that you can receive now. Uh, whereas prior to this, it was much more based on the client need. And mm -hmm. if they needed this many hours, then we would make a case to the OVR counselor and most of the time it was approved to meet that that person's need and and that's not there's it, it's much more um, complicated now and and it's harder to get those larger uh, amounts of, of units for support so that's OVR there are some uh, limitations with OVR as well in terms of if your income is over a certain amount you may have to pay a deductible for it. So that's the OVR program. And then the next program is the Medicaid waiver through the um, uh, Community Health Choices. Mm -hmm. And you have to be Medicaid eligible in order to qualify for that program. So that means the eligibility for Medicaid is about $1,300, uh, so $1,300 really to qualify. Um, and then there's some other things that uh, it's 2313. It, it's very confusing. And this is this makes it really complicated for someone for a brain injury to understand that there's one number for Medicaid eligibility, but then a different number to qualify for a waiver. So that's where it gets really confusing for folks. And then they don't know, hey, I might qualify for this program, so I should right. apply. Um, and that is a pretty comprehensive program. But if you think about it, if someone has worked and then they sustain a brain injury, mm -hmm. and they get Social Security's dis disability, if it's over that limit, then... Then they can't get any, any other services? No. And I think that something, I'm glad that you brought up the insurance meeting, the max on your insurance, because I know that this last year that Candace has worked really hard in pushing legislation and House Bill 1310 yes. back in April to try to get that coverage through insurance for cognitive rehabilitation. Yes. And hopefully that can be something that, you know, can keep being. Yes, we'll push that along down the pipeline through through Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it, and it's a shame because really, if someone doesn't qualify for HIP, OVR, or the Medicaid waiver, yes. then the only opportunity is speech therapy and occupational therapy to have access access to cognitive rehabilitation or or retraining, mm -hmm. and you get only so many visits a year. Mm -hmm. And we know, we know from research that those first two years after a brain injury are critical for rehabilitation. Yeah, help. Yes, and to be able to kind of progress forward uh, and to get people the help that they need when they need it most. Yeah, and there's also research that shows that um, the most successful outcomes is when a person has access to intensive outpatient rehabilitation. So that's not just our, you know, three sessions a week of, of yes. occupational therapy, speech therapy, and physical therapy. They're talking a, a community reentry program, which is really hard for people to have access to. Indeed. And so I wanted to talk to you about this application process. So I have a brain injury. My insurance is exhausted. I'm really desperate for some help. And I've got lots of choices that I have to navigate through which, which choice is right for me from state funding. What's the application process like? Can I manage that? It's very difficult. I will say so in the position that I am in now with Einstein Neurology, I help people to navigate a similar program. It's called the Aging Waiver that is also through the state of Pennsylvania for people 60 or older. And having me as a liaison to help people do this application is still challenging. Even saying here are the steps that we can do, here's when we're going to do them. Mm -hmm. And often it's working with a caregiver that, that I am working with a caregiver, you have caregiver burden, they're doing a lot already and they're saying, okay, now on top of working, on top of taking care of the kids, on top of helping my loved one get better, I have to manage this paperwork and this follow-up and all of these components that go into it and I don't know what I'm doing. And then to think about what if someone doesn't have that caregiver and we pull that piece out. Yes what are you supposed to do, right? And Abandoned. someone might hand you papers and say, here's what you're supposed to do with these. There are four steps to this process. This is the first one that I want you to do. And if you get lost at step one, what are the chances that you're gonna make it to steps two through four? Indeed. It can be very, very challenging, which is how the social work clinic that Jillian set up came about to help facilitate applications and getting people connected with resources. Because I think it's not just about 
you have to fill out this incredibly complex application, whether it, for OVR Please. and Medicaid, it's really you do an online application mm -hmm. for those, and they're really, really long, and you need to have a lot of information up front to fill out those applications. So if you're having a hard time with organization and planning, it's going to be hard for you to get the information that you need to complete those applications. Then the head injury program application is really, really intensive. They do have enrollment specialists that can help facilitate, mm -hmm. but the application is still a lot and you have to have your birth certificate and that proof of residency that we mentioned and your proof of income and um, it can be really challenging for someone who is going through the cognitive changes after a brain injury even physical changes to then collate that information together let alone the follow-up right. mm -hmm. the Medicaid waiver is really challenging to apply for and needs a ton of documentation and then it's staying on top of the multiple parties that are involved in processing the application. Mm -hmm. So there's a someone from the um, local area on, age, on aging mm -hmm. does the nursing assessment to determine are you, it's called uh, nursing home clinically eligible. And they come to your home to yes. do this assessment. Yes. yes. And, it, and it doesn't mean that you'll be placed in a nursing home, which is something that I really like to clarify for people. They just want to say, can we support you in your home to the yes. same degree that you would need in a skilled nursing facility? Because the whole goal of these programs is to make people independent in the yeah. community. So it's to facilitate support with those activities of daily living that, that Claire mentioned. So that's the one of the steps. And then once it's determined that you do need these services, you're med medically eligible, mm -hmm. then your application is sent to the county assistance office where they have to clear you financially. And in my experience, there is a, a huge hurdle in that part of the application process. The county assistance office takes a really long time to process that. They often are missing documentation. So for some reason, the independent enrollment broker is not quite communicating some of the application materials, and then they're sending letters asking for more documentation, which half the time the person has already submitted. Mm -hmm. And then it's making all those follow-up calls and resubmitting the documentation, and then the county assistance office misplaces it. I Can you say a long time? Is that a month or is that three months? It's usually six months. Six. Oh my goodness! That's what this I usually tell people. This is a critical time yeah. when these survivors need immediate assistance. Yeah, mm -hmm. and going back to support. Claire's point about having a caregiver. So when we think about the length of FMLA, so if someone does have a caregiver mm -hmm. and now that person is out of work to help assist this person who needs assistance with activities of daily living mm -hmm. and they need a home health aide to come in so that they can be supervised safely in the home while the caregiver now returns to their life roles, what happens? Right. So oh families goodness. face so much stress because of the nature of a brain injury and watching that loved one have those changes, mm -hmm. but then financially, that person is not working after the brain injury, and then it's affecting the financial stability of the, the, family, the family unit. The, the core unit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm also reminded that we don't recognize these deficits in people that we might, might see at the grocery store, at church, at, at hospitals, that we just don't recognize the brain injuries. So yeah. oftentimes I know that in the community they're complaining because people don't really recognize their challenges, mm -hmm. although they're so real and they can't go back to work and they can't do normal functions at home. But because I look good and I speak well, well, they, nobody knows that I don't sleep at night mm -hmm. and I can't complete an application. I can't go back to work. Yeah. So that's the population that we don't mm -hmm. really, it's an invisible population out there. 5.3 million Americans mm -hmm. have deficits related to brain injury. So this is, this is a big... It's no small problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's absolutely. Huge epidemic. So let's say that they do get approved by a miracle. They finally, they've gone through all the assessments and they are approved. What does that look like? What so that? depending on what sort of funding they get, head injury program, office of vocational rehab, or the uh, Medicaid waiver that Jillian had brought up, mm -hmm. uh, they offer different things for different times. So the head injury program is kind of the, I would say the gold standard for treatment. You get $100,000 of services. You don't get that money, but you get that money in services, but it's only for a year.
So if you want to come in once a week, you have this money set aside, but you're not going to end up using all that money. No matter what, you have one year of intensive case management and outpatient services. So that might mean visits to your home. That might mean okay. trips within the community to say, I'd like to learn how to take public transportation again. I am more nervous about missing my bus or not knowing where I am right. since my brain injury. So there are a lot of things that can go into that. But then once that year hits, you have six additional months of meeting once a week with your case manager for what's called transitional case management. Right from there, which is helpful so that it doesn't just stop at the door, okay. but now after a year and a half, you've run out of services. You're weaning you off of services. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. which hopefully you would be able to then apply for the Office of Vocational Rehab oh. and be able to say, Maybe all right, to go to work. yes, yeah. now that I feel a little bit more grounded at okay. home and in my community, what are the next steps for me? You know, I didn't finish my degree because this happened while I was enrolled in school, so maybe I'll start taking one class at a time and going back. Um, OVR used to, OVR meaning the Office of Vocational Rehab, used to fund schooling. I believe they've stopped they, they are doing no that. They are longer in this. supporting academic coaching, unless it so is... So students, are, have these, they don't have this service available to them? Unless it is for what they consider to be career advancement. So if someone currently is employed, right. it will be really challenging for them to be approved for OVR services or off vocational rehabilitation services from our understanding of what was explained to us. And there are changes that are going on within that office now to sort of, so it's not necessarily set in stone, but it is kind of, we're trying to figure out what that looks like for yeah. students. Um, in terms of work, someone will be able to go back to work and receive these services under OVR. However, it is also time limited. Once you are successfully placed in a position, mm -hmm. and Jillian and I think that in working with people who have had traumatic brain injuries, the longer you can help them transition into that position and do something that we call errorless learning there, so that every time if someone's, if you see someone about to make a mistake, you say, oh, we're not gonna do that, we're gonna do this over here instead. So coaching. Yes, mm -hmm. coaching, yes. Yeah. yep, yeah. and job coaching is what we call it. Okay. So, and giving someone that support, and so you think about starting a new job and how nerve-wracking that is for anyone in any job that you're mm -hmm. starting and now on top of it this might be your first job back you might have not had a lot of income since the injury mm -hmm. and there's a lot of pressure on this position and I want to keep this and I want to do yes. well and you don't want to be going to your supervisor every 10 minutes and saying I forgot how to do that thing again can you show me one more time which is what the job coach does so the job coach works as the intermediary to say hey, let's figure out a strategy mm -hmm. for you moving forward so that you don't have to go to them. So why don't we write it down? Why don't we keep a notebook in your pocket? Or why don't... Teach them, you have tools that they can implement. Yes, exactly. So working with someone to be successful at work, and the whole goal is so that they're successful on their own when the job coach is no longer there. And how long do you have a job coach? Is there a certain time limit to that OVR services as well? So now there is a limit on it. So a few years ago, we would ask for full-time job coaching for the first two to three weeks of employment. So if they're working 20 hours a week, we right. would be there with them for the full 20 hours a week, and then we'd gradually fade out our support based on their need. But at it, back in those days, if they needed a little bit more, mm -hmm. we could go to the OVR counselor and make a case for it. And in my experience, most of the time it was approved. Right. I'm thinking of our one specific mm -hmm. uh, client. Um, but now it is time limited. You only get a certain number of hours full time. So the first 40 hours are you can get coaching and then it weans down from there. And I remember asking for 120 hours in the first month because they need it, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's their ability to be successful, and you want to hold hands and, and get and, them there. And these are positions, Jillian and I have worked across the board from people that are returning to work doing stocking to people that are professors, that are lawyers, that are doctors. These are, everyone needs some degree of assistance that can be supported, but now there are more restraints on what can be offered. So that's if they do get approved. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that uh, that population that may not. Maybe they're evaluated and 
someone tells them, no, you're, you don't need services. You seem pretty good to me. So I think of a specific example of someone that Jillian and I had worked with, that it was eight years after his injury that he happened to find out about this program and say, that could be very helpful for me. Mm -hmm. I, let me try this out. And when you talk to him about, okay, so what were you doing in those eight years? I would do laundry. I would hang out. What were you doing before? I worked 40 hours a week. I would play basketball with my friends. I had all these friends. I was very engaged, but since the injury. For eight years. He was for eight years, yeah. It was just kind of. He was homebound. Yeah. yeah. And very isolated from from his community, from his friends, from his life before. Yeah, yeah. yeah things and you since, change. It's that new normal, yeah. which isn't normal. Yeah. And we know that people need social support and social connection and family support in order to have the best possible outcome after brain injury. So when someone is so isolated, it affects their ability to adjust and, you know, adjust to and relearn yes. the new the new normal, but also to find new meaningful activities and maybe slightly different, mm -hmm. but absolutely everyone after a brain injury can do meaningful good things in their life that feels good to them and mm -hmm. makes them feel that, that they're productive and contributing and, and you know, they're interacting with people and, and doing things that they love. Yeah, that feel good. And so can they do anything at home? Is there anything, all right, so oh, well, can I, I guess a better question or another question would be, can you go back and apply again? So you've been denied. Is there any recourse that they have to go back and say, no, I really need some help? Can you go, is there yeah, you absolutely any avenue can. that they can mm -hmm. go down to, mm -hmm. to reapply? So you can. For the Medicaid waiver, absolutely you can reapply. Mm -hmm. um, you can even, if you are denied, we assist people in appealing that decision. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it is not. But again, it's a lot more paperwork. And one client actually went down to Harrisburg and in front of a committee for the appeal, one of our case oh managers did that with him, and he was approved. And this was a gentleman who ambulated with a cane, was not an invisible disability, and was still denied services. So then that makes you think about those folks that it is invisible disability, the deficits are more cognitive in nature, then, you know, what happens? Um, so the Medicaid waivers, yes, you can appeal, you can um, reapply. The head injury program, I don't, I've never really seen anyone denied unless it's for income reasons. Okay. And if it's for income reasons, there's, there's nothing there's you nothing can do. Right. And if you can't prove Pennsylvania residency at time of injury, you don't get approved. Okay. So that is really cut and dry. Um, and then with OVR, mm -hmm. it, it's similar. You can appeal the decision or you can reapply down the road. Some people may apply for OVR and not be quite ready yes. to return yes. to work, especially if there's no other, no other options for mm -hmm. them, and mm -hmm. they are encouraged to reapply in the future. Well, that's good. That's At least it gives them some hope, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, although I'm sure they're discouraged, but if somebody encourages them to go back, and let's try this again, mm -hmm. at least that would give him some hope or her. Yeah. So tell us, is there anything to do at home? So you denied your services. It, the system is is so difficult to navigate. What do you do at home then? Instead of sitting for that ma gentleman eight years, is there anything he can do? So I think that it it can be difficult, especially when we talk about that depression yeah. component and these changing social roles. And I used to be a member of my community in this society in these specific ways, and now this has changed. I think that there are always things that people can do. Finding something meaningful, like Jillian said, mm -hmm. we always suggest volunteering. Mm -hmm. It is a great, great it is a great step on the way back to employment because you're building that resume. You're getting a network of references from people that say, Jillian, she's a great worker. I supervised oh. her for oh, like six months in this. Yeah, um, and and not everyone is there yet when they first have this injury. So trying to do cognitive cognitive exercises if they can. We're lucky to live in the age where the internet is so prevalent everywhere and trying to find some things that make you think. Reading if someone can or just doing something that's engaging. Listening to an audiobook or a TED talk or anything for the amount of time that you can because you're not going to be able to, okay, I've just been discharged from inpatient, I'm home, and I'm going to watch a two-hour movie and write up a report on it. It's yes. just cognitively might be a little bit much, but say you start with something that's eight minutes long and you say, I'm going to watch something 
that's eight minutes, and I'm gonna see if I can recap it. And just trying to push yourself a little bit more. There's certainly things that you can do in the home. We would like to see, like I mentioned earlier, that insurance funding, yes, cognitive yeah. therapy, so yeah. that people have that option as well. But um, it fun gets them out of the house as well. Mm -hmm. It gets yes. you, know, you have a purpose for. There's so the many, house. so many pluses yeah. for it. Absolutely. And I think making sure that you are completing your medical follow-up is so important. So seeing your neuro neurologist, if you have one, seeing a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician who specializes in brain injury, who will oversee your rehabilitation is so important. And to go to your physical therapy and your speech therapy and your occupational therapy. But accessing support groups. So there are a lot of brain injury support groups, especially in the Philadelphia and outskirts, mm -hmm. um, that could be really, really helpful to help survivors know that this is, this is I don't want to say normal, yes. but to validate their experience and be around other people that understand what they're going through. But then to also be able to tap into a network of, hey, this is what I'm doing that is helping me. Maybe you should try this. Yes. So I think that's really important as well. And I think also opportunities to go to the local rec center, see what free courses are being offered, go to art classes, just mm -hmm. something to do something that you might enjoy that will simulate your brain a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, yes, yes exactly. Yes. Stay active physically even, and mentally. Yeah, even a community uh -huh. cleanup or something that might yes. be at the library and oh, things in that are neighborhood. Exactly, things that are free and things that get you out and around other people. Indeed. I can't thank you enough for being here with us. It's yeah, really been a pleasure to talk with you, and I'm sure the audience is quite, it's an educational opportunity to understand a population that they may not be, they may not understand or they don't really uh, know anybody in the community. I know that we talk about traumatic brain injury patients, but there's also concussion patients as well mm -hmm. that have these same deficits, the same challenges that we have that mm -hmm. you just discussed. And um, if you would like more information about brain injury, or to learn about this remarkable work that Mind Your Brain Foundation does, please visit www.mindyourbrainfoundation.org. If you have any topic that you would like me to discuss, please send me an email to info at mindyourbrainfoundation.org. Be sure to join me next time for Minding Your Brain, when we'll talk about how to manage depression and emotional regulation after brain injury with an expert from Remed Rehabilitation Center right here. Thank you for joining us, and Happy New Year.